So if we look at this little chart, okay, just take a peek at it. Well, first of all, we need to celebrate the fact of our human condition when we're going through things in our life. And you know from the teaching of contemplative outreach and the scripture of Jesus' uh, temptation, you know, is power and control, affection, esteem, security, survival, and over-identification with your group. Getting caught up in power and control, you know, needing to always have it go your way. That, that's your human condition. Well, when I went on that cruise, I would love to have gone my way and I could have got to Bermuda and had a good time with the family and everything else. But I had to let it go. But I had to honor the fact there was a great disappointment that I wasn't able to go along with them to enjoy my brother's and sister-in-law's 50th wedding anniversary with their, with their little ones. You're going to know. You know, it's the disappointment. But I had no control over that. Affection and esteem. My God, I don't think my family ever loved me so much. I mean, there's, you know, they're, stand, they're sitting around this thing not knowing what's happened. I could feel their love and everything else. I have to honor that. I would hope that I was there for them if that happened to them. I need to celebrate that. Security and survival. You know, I mean, uh, you want me to go into that basket? And, and you're, you're going to pull me off this ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? And you're getting in my hel in a helicopter? Well, you, how about that needed to be trust, right? And overabundance and... Uh, and disidentification with my role. I could, I didn't have to act like a priest. I acted like a human being. I was scared. Nothing wrong with that. There's no role to play. Stiff upper lip. So the, the human condition will always be there and needs to be honored in order actually that the flow of God's life can move through you. There's nothing it reminds me when I went up to the mountain with Father Thomas in 1983 when, in this experience at Lama, and out of that came contemplative outreach and Thomas's determination really to have a organization, an organism to try to further the teaching of centering prayer, or I should say further the Christian contemplative tradition and everything else. Uh, people asked me, they said to me, you know, uh, what happened to you? Oh, and I told them honestly. I went up the mountain, and seriously, it was a mountain, up the mountain, a priest who happened to be a human being who was terribly in love with Christ. I came down the mountain, a human being who was terribly in love with Christ, who happened to be a priest. Because the basic underlining celebration isn't in your role. It's in dealing with your humanity and how much you love God, no matter what your role is. And Father Thomas used to say that sometimes your role can be get in the way of your spiritual journey because you think you have to live up to some sort of standard. Of course you've got to live up to a standard, but that doesn't become you. It's a means to an end. And the means of the end really is the fact of being a human being who appreciates the fact that I'm a human being and appreciates the fact that I love and my Lord loves me back. So that's, that's a human condition. Did I get an amen? amen? I think sometimes living up to our roles is a pain in the neck, especially when we do it so poorly. I'll repeat that for this side over here. <laughs> and then the second thing, your practice. What is your prayer practice each day to keep you alert to the fact that, that you're walking in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living? And become more and more aware of that. 
and whatever that practice is, you know, the importance is that we spend time, as you know, carving out time to give honor to what needs to be given honor to. I did a program in Seattle uh, with Jeff Renner, uh, uh, and he was talking about the nuns, how many people are, you know, deny the fact they have no religion, especially 30 and under. I don't blame them for not having any religion. They never had a chance to know what it was like to get involved in a ritual. I mean, what is Sunday morning like in this American culture? It's soccer, it's baseball, it's all these other d things that they go to, and, and somehow or other, if a parent really struggles, they can get them to church. And when they're getting to church, they're in church with their soccer outfit and their baseball outfit because they have some place to go. It doesn't, it, it's not part of their life. I mean, it isn't. And let's not get into the whole thing that the church, especially Roman Catholic Church with all the, and I'm a Roman Catholic priest, you know, with all the sexual abuse that has gone on. And how even though the church is doing all it can to kind of stop that, the reports still go out as if it's happening uh, like it used to happen. You know, when the Pennsylvania report went out, you know, it, it lasted, listed 482 incidents. Horrendous, terrible. It doesn't matter if it's the same percentage as all other professions. We're called to something more than that. But what it doesn't say when that report came out about what went on in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania was nothing except two cases have been in this new century of 19 years. And so the message doesn't get out that well, as good as it should. It's horrendous. And if you want to read a good little book, uh, Bishop Robert Barron has a book, Letters, to the suffering church. It is absolutely excellent. He puts, he lays all the cards out and all he says is, uh, fight, give it another chance, take a good look. Don't run away from a tradition that has been very meaningful for thousands of years. But the point is, what is your practice? What do you listen to? What do you hear? And that affects our ability to celebrate what God does in our life. If it's always bad news, for goodness sake, well then it's horrendous. And we get all wrapped up in all sorts of stuff. I used to have a workshop that I did. I hope this, is this making sense to you? Not too much that side. Is this making sense? All right, okay, good. I used to have a workshop where I would work my way down, and then at the end I had Republicans, Democrats, okay? This was years ago. And then in the middle, I had a, a, a piece of paper over a secret word. Okay, so we're talking about the Republicans are very much into self-advancement. The Democrats are into making sure everybody's on board. Kind of reminds me of my uh, adopted nephew who's a Marine when I asked him, I said to him, what did you learn in the Marines? He said, I learned discipline and no one's left behind. And I thought, boy, could that be a one golden rule to live by? Discipline and no one is left behind. So here we had the Republicans and the Democrats in this little chart, and me giving a workshop. So I said, the secret answer is this. And then I moved the paper away and said, it said, contemplative. And then I said to them, in an, a, this was 20 years ago. I haven't done it recently. I don't know if I would get through the talk. Okay, all right. And, and, I, and I said, that's the answer. Be a Republican, but have a contemplative soul. Be a Democrat. Have a contemplative soul, because the con contemplative looks at the bigger picture. And it, the contemplative builds bridges. The contemplative, in a certain sense, 
appreciates all life at any level and all God's people. And you can do that as a Republican and you can do that as a Democrat. And that's that inner, what is your practice? What is your, you know, I, I, I used to like a, uh, I, uh, you people are old people, older people. So, um, that, uh, do you remember Tally Savalas? You remember the detective? I always loved him. He had the lollipop in his mouth. You remember that? You know, and what was his favorite saying? Who loves you, baby? Who loves you, baby? Right, who loves your baby? When everything's said and done, who loves your baby? That's an important little concept. Father Basil Pennington, one of the, one of the um, uh, creators, if you would, I'm, that's not right, creator, but one of the people who worked to renew the Christian contemplative tradition, along with Father Keating and then Father Menninger also, okay, uh, used to have a wonderful little uh, thing that he did on his retreats. He had the people begin, and myself, because I went on one of his treats and this is, retreats, and this is how it came to me. He had this wonderful little uh, exercise. He would say, okay, list the four impo most important people in your life. List your four most, your four most important gifts. List your four most important material goods. List your four most wonderful dreams, if you would, or, or, or priorities. So you had the people, you had gifts, you had the material good, and then the four uh, priorities in your life that were important in your life, okay? And then he would give four conferences and so he would go begin his first conference. He says, erase all the material you have in the four columns in the fourth level. Give the next conference, erase everyone you have on the third level. Erase everything on the second. Erase everything on the first and ask yourself, who loves you? I think that's a powerful, powerful, like a little exercise about, you know, uh, your practices. What, what can you give up and let go of? Because at the end, you're gonna let go of it all. It's, you, you have no other choice. But they were all, are they means to help you realize that in the end, the Lord's standing there with a lollipop in his mouth saying, who loves you, baby? Who loves you when everything's said and done? And that's our Christian faith. But also under practices, I like to think maybe in our lives, what's our re routine in our life? How do we get in the mess that we can't make time for the important things that we want to do in our life. If there's one thing you and I have created, okay, is the fact we created our routine. No one forced our routine on us. Oh, you go to work and everything else, but the, it wasn't forced on you. Somehow or other, the routine is there, and sometimes it brings life, and sometimes it doesn't bring life to you. I remember when people would talk to me, you know, about the fact that actually, you know, I can't seem to get my centering prayer in each day. I said, why don't you get up earlier? Oh, dear God, get up earlier. Oh, dear Lord, I get up early. I mean, with my schedule and everything, I, I, you know, I need my sleep. Well, is that a commandment from God? Joe, you can get up earlier because you will not function properly unless you get your proper sleep. Yes, Lord. Yeah, why can't you change your routine? Make the time for what's important. 
And so I believe one of the struggles we have in looking what to sell, celebrate the fact that somehow or other, God has given you and I a gift of management that we're able to make the time to do the important things that we want to do each day. And I'm thinking now, centering prayer twice a day. And if you can't get it in the second time, do it longer in the morning. But the point is actually, you write your own daily schedule for the most part, open to the interruptions of each day, but you write, you're, you're the producer of your daily schedule. Right? That's your routine. Now, I'll tell you a little side thing that interests me as we try to celebrate our life and everything else. I want to start a 12-step program for coffee drinkers. <laughs> I really do. When we have a, an extended retreat, what's the first thing people ask? What time is the coffee available in the morning when I get up? If that isn't drug addiction, I think, oh my God. If I don't have it, now obvious to you, I'm not a coffee drinker. I have my own problems. But the point is actually, look, the, the routine I must have, I must do this and everything. I hope you, I, I don't, hope you're not hearing this as criticism. It isn't meant to be. But just to look at maybe what we have to celebrate. Thank God I can get up. You know, thank God I have a, can get a cup of coffee. But to thank that and don't see that as a, a stumbling block that my day is going to be ruined if I don't have a cup of coffee. Then the last, the next part is the graces. The wonderful little surprises that come into our life. These little aha moments. How many times have you been going through your day and then someone says something to you and after a while you begin to think about it and you say, that was, that is very helpful. I'm glad I had this conversation with this person. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking of the fact actually of, of um, a priest myself standing outside a church and people making comments about, you know, how my sermon went. Um, and I could, I could get angry at that because they didn't appreciate how much time I put into it but I've learned to listen because many times in the critical comment, there's a gem that was important for me to see or an insensitivity to what somebody was experienced by the flippant comment that I made. It makes you, it makes you kind of more sensitive. It would aggra that's what aggravates many times uh, you when you get a cookie answer, you know, from your medical uh, doctor who seems to minimize the pain that you're get going through. Oh, it'll pass. You know, it'll pass. Well, at that particular moment, you don't want to hear it'll pass. You want to say, you know, I can appreciate what you're going through with this, uh, this particular moment in your life. And then there's the part of magnifying God. You know, how without you knowing it, many times actually, the way you approach something is, makes it, uh, gives you life, if you would. Uh, people will say, you know, you're a real inspiration to me about how you handle your generosity, your hospitality, your willingness to volunteer for things. You know, I really appreciate that in you, and you kind of look up and say, oh, 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 okay, okay. So I invite you to close your eyes. You've heard what I've had to say. More important, what the Spirit is saying to you 
about the events in your life, special moments when God's grace was so evident, what you learned about your human condition, you know, power and control, affection, esteem, security and survival, over-identification with your group, you know, what you learned, the positive experience, negative experience, all being something to be celebrated. There's such a need to celebrate in this day and age what we do have with the negative energy that is around, blaming nobody but just saying it's around. And that if we don't send out celebration, uh, then I, we should be some of the people that sends out celebration that there is something joyful and, and marvelous to be in because we're so well taken care of her in many ways actually that we don't even realize ourselves. So to heal, very important. To forgive, very important. But don't forget to celebrate. I want to end with one of the prayers that's on the little sheet that you received. It's the prayer of abandonment. When Father Thomas Keating, I'm presuming you, everyone here knows Father Thomas Keating or heard of him, who died in October. Um, um, he went back to, uh, to Spencer uh, uh, to be taken care of, and that's where he ended up dying. Um, I went to visit him in, he died in October 25th, he, and I went to visit him in the beginning of July, uh, myself and the former president of a contemplative outreach, Gail Fitzpatrick Hoppler, that could never have visited him unless he was on sea level, because she, even though he kept coming, saying to her, please come, please come, but she couldn't go to 8,000 feet. But when I was there, I said to Father Thomas, uh, as we finished our little visit, um, I said, could I pray with you the prayer that I prayed over my dad when my dad was dying of cancer from asbestos uh, because he was a sheet metal worker and coppersmith who, as an aside, made my silver chalice for me when I was ordained a priest 59 years ago. So he said, you know, those who have, I don't know if you've ever met him or heard of him, but I, can I, could I pray this prayer over you? And he goes, yes. Yes. You know, he has that nice way. Yes. Yeah. So I prayed this prayer over him. And when I finished praying, I, he said to me, can I have a copy of that prayer? I said, sure. The interesting thing is when I came back in the middle of September, uh, the abbot, Abbot Damien at Spencer, you know, said to me, you know, he has us pray this prayer with him every day. Every day. And then the abbot said to me, isn't it interesting? I find it interesting with his great love of uh, the contemplative tradition that at these final hours he's holding on or he's being supported by a prayer of words, not just of silence. And so my thought is actually, and uh, that's why the prayer is appearing more and more, is the fact that maybe this is Father Thomas Keating's um, way of expressing what a prayer of consent is all about. If this is what he held on to as he was going to meet his maker through, you know, uh, July, August, September, and to the end of October. So, can we pray it together as our closing thought? And then Kathleen has an announcement uh, to make, and, and I can't thank you enough for coming this evening.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me and in all your creatures. I wish no more than this, O Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you with all the love of my heart. For I love you, Lord, and so need to give myself, to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with confidence, for you are my Father. Amen. And may we all keep Father Thomas in our hearts and know that uh, life is only changed, is not ended, and so he's very present when we gather together. So thank you for, for being here and allow me to share this time with you. <laughs> 